Okay, um, welcome everyone to our second annual Spotlight on Transition Symposium. To this year's is promoting independence and um, I think everyone here knows how important independence is for students who are transitioning into college, transitioning into employment, internships, all sorts of different opportunities. So I want a show of hands here. How many students are here thinking about going to college or are in college right now? Okay, some people are a little shy, keeping their hands down. I think there's a crew of them still outside. All right, so that's exciting. Um, welcome everyone to the Chestnut Hill campus. Um, for those of you who've never been here before, this school was established in 1924, so we are coming up on our 100th year anniversary. So there's a lot of history here, and you'll hear a little bit more about our mission um, during our introduction. And um, for quick housekeeping items today. All the tables have a QR code on them. The QR codes will take you directly to the Spotlight on Transition webpage. The webpage has the schedule, okay, the schedule for the day on it, so you'll know what's coming up next. I'm gonna do a quick overview now. Um, first up, we're gonna have our college and career readiness panel. So we'll be talking a little bit about what it means to transition to college from the standpoint of the professionals, all right? After that, probably what a lot of you are more interested in hearing about is from the students directly, all right? You're gonna hear from students directly about what they wish they knew as a first year student, all right? You'll get to ask questions, um, and yeah, it's a great group, so you'll get to hear a lot of information about your first year in college. Following that, we'll have a presentation on financial readiness. And then after that, at the very end, all of you got a worksheet called the Empowerment Worksheet. And that's a time at the very end where we can connect with our panelists, you can connect with our exhibitors, and talk about what steps, what concrete steps you wanna take to get ready to make that transition for college, for employment, internships, things like that, all right? Um, Restrooms are outside behind this, not outside, outside, outside of this room, behind the staircase. All right, we also have a gender inclusive restroom, so if you need one, um, please just ask myself or any of the CHC staff here, okay? Um, there is food outside. The food is for all of you to enjoy as much or as little as you would like, okay? Feel free at any time to get up, to come out and get a drink, to get extra food, whatever you would like, all right? So please feel free to come in and out of the space as you see fit. There is a quiet space um, directly across from here. It's labeled as the Redmond Room. So if you want to take a break from this area, you're welcome to just go right on across the hall and take a break in there. If there's a vendor, an exhibitor you really want to connect with, um, you're welcome to stand up, take a break, head right over. Um, whatever works for you, okay? This is very, very informal. I don't want you to feel like you're chained to your tables, okay? You're welcome to move around as much as you'd like. Um, now, to welcome us today, I have the pleasure of introducing my supervisor, who is Dr. Krista Bailey Murphy, who is our Vice President of Strategic Innovation and our Title IX Coordinator here at CHC. She holds a PhD in Educational Psychology from Temple, where her dissertation focused on risk mitigation strategies amongst high-risk, high-achieving college students. Krista has worked at Chestnut Hill for almost 18 years. The majority of your time at CHC was spent in student life, and she's excited that she now has the privilege of engaging with the CHC community in new ways, working with Student Success, Neurodiversity, and the Center for Accessibility and Learning Services. All of us are under the umbrella of Strategic Innovation, which looks at retention and is a pretty cool department, um, the most innovative department on campus, for sure. Um, and so we're really excited to be included within that group. Um, Krista also is married to Ryan Murphy, assistant professor of sociology here at CHC, mother to Liam, the coolest 10-year-old she knows. She enjoys coaching Liam's soccer team, running marathons, driving all over for youth sports. I'm sure some people can relate to that in here. Um, eating all the carbs, I can relate to that. Um, and more than anything, traveling with her family. So with, with no further ado, um, Dr. Murphy, thank you. Thank you. 
Well, good afternoon. And thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I sound way more interesting and exciting on paper than sometimes I think I am in person. But hopefully my 10-year-old disagrees with that, that I'm just as exciting in person. Um, so I am thrilled to be able to welcome you today to the Spotlight on Transition Symposium. Um, if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I would like to take you on a quick history tour. So who here likes history? Anyone? Oh, good. All right. So most of you are with me then. I like it. All right. So as Laura said, Chestnut Hill College was founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph in 1924. And the Sisters of St. Joseph were founded by a Jesuit priest. So shout out to any of our St. Joe's colleagues in the room. Um, Father Jean-Pierre Madai in 1650 in Le Puy, France. Now, at that time, women were meant only to live in cloister. So they weren't meant to be out and about amongst other people, unlike today, hopefully. <laughs> However, the six original sisters felt called to respond to the needs of the city and to practice what would eventually be coined an active inclusive love for all dear neighbors without distinction from whom we do not separate ourselves. So the most important part of that is an active inclusive love. It's active, it's work. I frequently find myself marveling that what those original sisters in 1650 felt was needed is still needed today in 2024. The first sisters arrived in, uh, of St. Joseph arrived here in Philadelphia uh, on this property in 1847. Now they arrived from Fan France via St. Louis and then to Philadelphia, so not the most direct route to get here. But while in St. Louis and establishing their first congregation here in the United States, one thing I think is very interesting, especially thinking about education in this space, is they taught students who are deaf. So we have French-speaking sisters who don't know English, but also learn American Sign Language. And they taught the children of freed slaves. So once again, cementing their dedication to inclusion and an active love. The first sisters who arrived here in Philadelphia um, were so impressive to Bishop Kenrick that he wrote that they were, and I quote, ready for any good work. And with that spirit is what I see here today, are people who are ready for any good work. Um, and I think for most of us who have careers in education, that's part of what our calling has been. And so at this time, we welcome all of our colleagues um, from other colleges and universities, from the Neurodiversity Employment Network, OVR, the Office of, Dis of Disability Services, families, um, students, and of course, for me, my favorite part of the welcome is to our Chestnut Hill College students, who I think are fabulous. And so flowing from the original roots, um, Chestnut Hill College, among many other wonderful parts of our mission, really wants to work toward a more unified global society. And so the neurodiversity initiative here is really the perfect outgrowth of that piece of our mission. The focus on the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, including recognition of the value in brain differences to empower student advocacy and authenticity. And so as we are at the beginning of Disability Awareness Month and look forward to Neuro Neurodiversity Celebration Week, let us be instruments of inclusion. Let us celebrate the beauty of our diversity and let us empower each other, whether that's as colleagues, as peers, as parents, as friends, to do the same. So going back to Father Jean-Pierre Madai, he wrote 100 maxims for the original sisters and they were meant to be tiny little nuggets of guidance meant to develop their relationship with God, with self, and with others. I'd like to share one of my favorite maxims today. And for those keeping score at home, it's maxim number 64. I know you all thought that's what it was gonna be. And this one I think really speaks not only to what I believe is important to us on campus, but I also think it speaks directly to the vision that Laura has brought specifically to the program here at Chestnut Hill College um, in its creation and in its base and inclusivity. And what it says, you can read it up here, is seek to be kind always to everyone and unkind to no one. I'm gonna say that again. Seek to be kind always to everyone and unkind to no one. So I did not script this part, but I will say, like Laura said, I have a 10-year-old, 
And every day when he gets out of the car, I say to him that all I want for you today is to be kind. And it's so important. And we all have the opportunity to give that gift to each other. And we have the opportunity to then receive that gift from others. And so I hope that you walk away today feeling the kindness of our community. And so, before I start to cry like a baby, <laughs> um, with deep gratitude to Laura and to all of um, the staff that helped for today, um, thank you for choosing to share part of your rainy afternoon with us. Um, and I have one wish for you, aside from kindness today, is that you leave here today with one new piece of information one new friend or connection, and one new dream or vision to take with you from this place. And even more importantly than that, I hope you take that in the spirit of our original sisters and go out and circle the city with love, and that you find a way to take that vision and dream and put it into practice, whether that's in education, in social ways, pastoral ways, um, and respond, respond to others with an eye towards inclusion and unity. And so I hope you have a wonderful day today, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I'm going to ask our first panelist to come up and join. Um, so this is our College and Career Readiness panel. All right. And I'm going to be the facilitator for this panel. And I realize that I know many of you in here, but I don't think I actually introduced myself. Um, so forgive me. Uh, my name is Laura. I'm the executive director here, uh, executive director of neurodiversity initiatives here at Chestnut Hill College. And um, my role is really to create um, inclusive spaces on campus for our neurodivergent learners. And so that's my passion, my calling. Um, and it's really, truly been a wonderful experience. Let's go ahead and meet our panelists here. I'm just going to introduce everyone um, by their name and where they're working. And then I'll let them go ahead and give a little bit more information about what they do. And then we're going to go ahead and start in on the questions for the panel, OK? Um, all right. So right beside me here, I have Sharon Thompson from Eastern University. This is Sherry Fishbaugh from Westchester University, Amy Edwards from Drexel University, Kate Russell from the Neurodiversity Employment Network, Ali Gata McNamara from St. Joseph's University, and Wes Garten from University of Delaware. Okay, so we are well represented in the Philadelphia area here. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and pass this. Well, you, you have two, so you can use your two, and I'll hold this one. All right. We're going to just switch it out. There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm Sharon Thompson. I am the program coordinator for the College Success Program at Eastern University. It's a program um, designed specifically for students on the autism spectrum. Um, we provide comprehensive support services for um, social, academic, and residence life needs of students who are enrolled in the program. I'm, I actually got it working. Um, <laughs> That's what I was uh, preoccupied with. So Sherry Fishbaugh, Westchester University. So I run their Dub C Autism Program. Yeah, Dub C, just so you guys know, is slang for Westchester, Dub W C Chester. No, I did not name it, actually our students did. Um, but I'm there to help the students with executive functioning, uh, career and employment, uh, Oh gosh, what other? There's five different social, All the things, independence, yeah, <laughs> yeah those types of things. Um, and then, in addition to helping not only our students, but a big part of our job is obviously to build a, an inclusive campus as well. So, um, making sure that our staff and faculty are trained and, and can best support our students. Hi, everybody. I am Amy Edwards. I'm the director of the Center for Autism and Neurodiversity at Drexel University formerly known as the Drexel Autism Support Program. We changed the name last year. Um, I do everything Sherry just said. Um, we also do academic coaching, and because we have co-op, we do a lot more uh, employment support for co-op. Hopefully, oh good, this one's on too. Hello everyone, my name is Kate Russell. I'm here with the Neurodiversity Employment Network. We are a nonprofit network whose mission is to connect employers, universities, job seekers, advocates and allies, really anyone with a vested interest in neurodiversity and employment in the greater Philadelphia area. So we get to work closely with many of these college programs, but also look to bring new people into this conversation, new employers help make some of those connections. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Allie McNamara. I'm our Associate Director of College Support at the Aspire Program at St. Joseph's University, um, and I do a lot of the same things that everyone else does. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's fun. Uh, pass it on. Hey everyone, I'm Wes Garten. I'm the program manager of Spectrum Scholars. Uh, we call ourselves a college to career initiative for autistic uh, college students. Um, I do a lot of what my colleagues have said, um, training, support. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one groups with students. Um, we like to think we're a very sort of strengths-based um, program, so we're looking to see and support students developing skills in all the areas that they're interested in. Uh, while also, of course, recognizing that there are challenges and so sort of giving them the skills and the strategies to sort of navigate college life and into employment. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I'm going to note that we are a bit behind on scheduling, so we're going to be pushing about 15 minutes back. So whatever you're seeing on your on the schedules online will be about 15 minutes later than that. And also for our next panelists and presenters, just so you know. Um, and the reason like, I wanted to start with this panel and I also wanted all of these wonderful people here is to show that in the Philadelphia area, we are a community. We work collaboratively, we work together, we aren't competing with each other. Like we truly want what's best for all students. And so um, whatever that means for your students, like any one of us is gonna be there to make recommendations, to make support, to, to just talk to you about, hey, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? We all have like differences with how we do things, but just like every university is, is different. Um, so I think it's really important to know that like all of us talk to each other like there's if you have a question about one school you can you can talk to any of us really um so it just like that, that was important for me to to share with you all today so for the first topic um if someone can answer for me what is the role of a disability or accessibility services office okay so i'm going to take that one um so the role of the, the Disability Services Office is to make sure that the university is on a level playing field. So they provide accommodations to students such as extended test time, note takers, um, things of that sort, distraction reduced testing spaces. Um, but what they do is they basically bring the university up to a level playing field in regards to ADA um, to make sure basically that the university you know, is being compliant. Um, our programs kind of go above and beyond that. So students, you know, K through 12, they're entitled to, to accommodations. They're entitled to getting, you know, supports. Everyone knows their supports. Once they reach 12th grade and they graduate, all bets are off. They're now covered by ADA. They're no, cover, they're no longer covered by IDEA or whatever we're calling it now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they come to, um, they come to college. They're now eligible. They now have to seek out their accommodations. So I know at Drexel, what we'll do if a student needs accommodations, we will help connect them with the Disability Resources Office, and they'll sign consents that allow us to talk to disability resources and other people across campus. And that goes into the second part of that question. How is that different from the learning support programs? So again, we kind of go above and beyond that. So we, people ask me what my job is. I say I connect the dots. Yeah. Um, which is a lot, I think, of what we do. We help them find the resources and kind of give them the steps in order to, to get, you know, tutoring to get the accommodations that they need. Um, we provide a lot more support around, you know, academics. We kind of break things down a little bit more. Um, and again, it depends on the student, which I think any of us could say, um, mm -hmm. what supports they need and what individual, you know, strengths and weaknesses they have. Anybody else want to? Jump in. I'll jump in. Of course, I will. All right. Um, so it, I, I just think about um, a little bit more from our program's standpoint is actually there's resources that are not always active within disability services. So what that means is being able to help and break down from an executive functioning standpoint. Can we break down that assignment? Can we also assist within the socialization? So um, when Amy's talking about collecting the doc, Okay, I wanted to join Robotics Club. How do I get to Robotics Club? Well, let's look it up and, and get you there and see when they're meeting next time. 
Um, I want, I need help with housing. I don't know if I'm independent enough to live at, in the residence hall. So we're there to help them with resources so that they can connect to the, um, to see if they're independent enough. You know, are they able to live in that dorm room, getting up on time, taking their medications, getting to class, knowing that they need to come back, take out the trash so we don't have science experiments. Um, <laughs> so those type of things. So it's kind of going up and beyond what you would see within what disability services would provide of those SDIs um, and those accommodations uh, in the academic world. Yeah, and I think the way I look at it, how many people in here are familiar with um, IEPs or any ed educational plans and what they look like? Okay, so when you're looking at disability services, you're looking more at the accommodations side, really like the accessibility side, the accommodations such as extended time, distraction free, like Amy was saying. When you look at learning support programs, you're looking more at services. And I don't mean like speech language services, I mean like the direct one-on-one -on -one supports that Sherry and Amy were talking about in coaching, in um, you know, working with the writing center and doing like different classes. Like for us, we have a specific class that students take. So I see it more as like service oriented or support oriented than like accommodation oriented. Um, we started to touch on this, but like how would you consider eligibility in college different than eligibility in high school? Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, so thinking about, you know, eligibility differences in high school versus college, um, every disability service office at every college is going to have a very handy website, at least most of us should, uh, that outlines what is required in terms of documentation for uh, accommodations. So, you know, it's very important for all of you who are in high school right now that you get that updated documentation. Um, most disability services are going to be looking for that to be within the past three years. And that documentation needs to have qualifying information to determine what accommodations a student is eligible for. Um, they really get into the weeds. I know St. Joe's has a, a great website, I'm sure everyone else does, that talks about what specifically those evaluations need to have. That's always really great to send over to the school district and say, I need this in the report, right? I need all of these things. Um, because just a one-page letter that states, you know, the student has a disability and I think they should get these accommodations, oftentimes is not going to be enough um, in terms of eligibility for accommodations. Um, so thinking about, you know, what the differences are between accommodations and what some may have as modifications is that there's no way that in college the actual curriculum can be changed, right? So there has to be the same exams, the same assignments, the same um, objectives, right? The accommodations that come into play would be things like Amy mentioned of extended testing time, distraction-free testing, possibility of a note taker. But again, there's no sort of modifications to the course material. And would you say there are critical questions to ask a disability or accommodations office prior to enrollment? Absolutely. So as you are looking, you know, at different schools, um, you're always welcome to reach out to the disability services or if you're connected to one of our programs, um, we're usually a liaison to those services. So many of us are um, outside of that disability services office, but function in a way that we work very congruently. Um, some questions that would be really helpful is even just to, you know, if, if you as a student or as a parent, your child has an IEP to kind of go through that and say, this is what my, my child is currently getting, you know, what would this look like in a college setting? Um, some of those things might be very different. For example, um, you know, many colleges do not allow for any sort of one-on-one -on -one support in the classroom. Um, there are, you know, deadlines, due dates often have to be very much the same for all students because you get all of your dates at the beginning of the semester, right? So having, you know, a very set um, schedule for the semester means that the deadlines need to be the same for every student. Again, these are just some things that I hear from parents a lot and from students a lot of, this is what I currently have now. What will this look like in college? Um, and really asking what accommodations would be available depending on the student-specific documentation. 
Yeah, and I think what's also important here is to understand that within a high school, if you have an IEP and you take that IEP anywhere across the country, they implement it as is. And in a college setting, um, each college has their due process that they do within their organization, like within the entity. They follow the same procedure within that college. But how I do things may look different at each institution. Right, so it is really important to ask questions. Like for me, I am not very stringent on a three-year rule in looking at things because, um, again, when we talked about inclusive environments and things like that, there's a lot of barriers for you know students of color and accessing um, assessments and evaluations and things like that. So it's something that, like, purposely within the the like how our college works and what we believe, like that's how we operate. And so it is important to ask those kinds of questions when you go to a college disability services office because they are going to look different um, in terms of what documentation. And, and that's, that is very different from high school where you're implementing something as is. So each organization is gonna look a little bit different um, and then I guess quickly for this one, does a student eligible for services in high school mean they automatically receive accommodations in college? No. Yeah. Um, so this is not an automatic process and this is a very student led process in college. So, you know, for my juniors and seniors in high school, it's very important that you understand what your disability is and what accommodations would be helpful for you or what sort of accommodations you are getting now. Um, as students need to be the one initiating this process, a lot of times parents are, are welcome to be a part of it, but students have to be the one initiating. And a lot of times once students have accommodations, it's not always an automatic process for each accommodation. So for example, and again, this might look different at every school, um, but at St. Joe's, if students have extended testing time, they still need to submit a request for every exam a week ahead of time. So again, that's where our programs come in to help connecting those dots, right? If students need to submit a request for their exam a week ahead of time, then that's something that our types of programs can help students to access and make sure Hey, it's two weeks before your exam. Let's let's put that in now, right before we forget, or let's put them in three months ahead of time. Yeah. You can never put them in too early. Um, so, not an automatic process, um, but that's where our programs can really come in to help is to make sure students are accessing those accommodations that they are eligible for. Yeah, and I think thanks for using that example because I think that's really important. Is like, well, why wouldn't they just put like everything? Why wouldn't they just do that? And that's an agency thing, right? So that's coming up with the student agency in initiation and teaching that skill of this is like these are what I, these are the things that I need to do in order to be successful. It's that self awareness and recognizing that hey, maybe for this course, I do need extended time on this exam. Maybe for this course, I'm really okay with it. Or for this class, I wanna take it in the classroom. For this class, I wanna take it elsewhere. So the professor doesn't make the assumption that a student is going to use it, right? Because you're, you're leveling the playing field. The student is able to request it as part of their accommodations, but they need to request it. Um, so it's just a different way of kind of thinking about it. It's, it's not like, well, why don't they just automatically do it? It's that the student is de developing the awareness and what it is that they need, and we're not making assumptions about what they need. The professor's not making assumptions about what they need. Um, and kind of shifting a little bit into employment. Uh, a lot of students have interest in internships and federal work study, um, and then transitioning obviously to employment after college. So one basic question, do, do employers provide accommodations? And then do accommodations translate from workplace to workplace? Sure, I will kick it off here uh, with the caveat that I'm not a lawyer, so check in before <laughs> <laughs> acting on this, right? So the, the Americans with Disabilities Act also applies to employers, specifically to those who have 15 or more employees. And by that, they are required to provide reasonable accommodations to job seekers uh, coming through the interview process and employees with disabilities. Similar to what you've heard, this does require disclosure to access those accommodations. And what is reasonable is a little bit fluid, right? So it's not necessarily like Allie was saying that if you had this accommodation in college, it's going to follow you to the workplace. But this is 
you know, mandated by federal law that accommodations are provided. You have seen in recent years some employers like these colleges go above and beyond with accommodations specifically for neurodivergent candidates and employees, so neurodiversity hiring programs or specific resources that are available for neurodivergent candidates. So as an example, maybe an alternative interview process or you know, permission to wear noise canceling headphones, right? Some, some are small accommodations and some are larger. So it, it is gonna vary a lot from employer to employer, but they are legally mandated uh, if you do disclose that you need that accommodation. From workplace to workplace, similar to how all the, the colleges work, it's not going to transfer one-to-one. -one. Every time you go to a new workplace, you're gonna have to start that conversation again. Uh, you might have a better understanding of what you need and be able to ask for it better, but that is an individual process for each employer. Okay, thank you. Do you think it will single people out to request accommodations at work? And then also, can people receive accommodations during internships? Anybody else want to jump in? I don't want to take too much. You know, we, we hear differing opinions from job seekers and from hiring managers on requesting accommodations, right? There is the reality that there is still stigma out there, right? So there, there's always a risk to disclosing. And I do want to recognize that. It's, it's not this perfect world that we live in. But the hope is that disclosing provides a more equitable workplace and does not single you out, right? There by the, the statistics, one in four people has a disability, right? So hopefully it shouldn't use single you out too much, but we hear people who have differing opinions on, on whether or not it's beneficial. Yes, you can receive uh, accommodations during internships, part-time employment, uh, all of that uh, is accessible. And I was gonna say with internships, sometimes our programs get involved or the disability services offices get involved. I would say from my experience in that as well, like we kind of support that process a little bit more. I'm just gonna piggyback off of you, Kate. Um, to when you're talking about, I think that's one of the main questions we get, do you disclose or not? Yeah. I mean, that's something that comes at, up at every conference that we're at, every symposium. Students coming up to us all the time um, asking, do I disclose in my cover letter? When should I disclose? How does this happen? And it really comes down to what does the student feel comfortable with? Mm -hmm. So there are different ways. One, in a cover letter, if my student feels comfortable disclosing, it gets wrapped in a bundle of talking about their strengths. Mm -hmm. Due to my autism and my attention to detail, I'm a very productive student or employee, and they go through, I. I do like to work in a quiet environment, though, and prefer my own office, whatever it may be, right? See how it gets wrapped in there? Of These are my strengths. This is what I'm going to ask for. And then in back on a strength. Remember, I, have, I, I finish my assignments very early, right? Give me some examples of that. Because, and I will tell you, I, I'm sure that we all have stories. The productivity of our students in the employment world is amazing. To put it into perspective, I had, a I had three students go and help out our, IRB, our IR, our institutional research department, do a project that's supposed to take the entire, entire term, summer term. It took them two weeks. The question was, did they take breaks, <laughs> right? And I'm saying that because I think it's really important to, if you feel comfortable disclosing, disclose. Talk about your strengths because your employers are looking for that as well, your supervisors. Also, I hear from the employment standpoint too, if you don't disclose, then I don't know how to help. I don't know that you may need accommodations. And there are fabulous um, resources to figure out the accommodations from lighting to sounds, to, tech, to, to tactile, um, to different, when we talk about accommodations, different types of um, apps and resources that all they have to do is, there's an app for everything this case. <laughs> That's all I ever hear from my um, Office of Accessibility is there's an app for that, Sherry. Yeah, let's download that. So I just wanted to say it's really up to the students. Employers say, please do so I know how to help and you can advocate. Um, uh, but really focus on the strengths part of that too. Now let's transition into everyone's favorite, FERPA. <laughs> um, how many of you have heard of FERPA before? 
Okay, great. So you're, you're covered under FERPA now, right, students? Your educational rights are actually owned by who currently? Who has educational rights when you're in high school? You or your parents? Parents. Who has educational rights when you go to college? The students do, okay? So that's a big transition. You take over your own educational rights, um, which means that you're in control of who has access to that information. That's basically what FERPA is talking about. And when you get asked when you are starting college to sign FERPA waivers, it means that you're allowing people um, certain information that they can be, it can be disclosed can, not obligated. And that's where the nuance comes in of why we wanted to have these discussions because again, it's gonna vary college to college. There are certainly very specific policies surrounding FERPA and what can be disclosed. Like for us, GPA and grades, we, can't, we cannot email that information. We can't tell you over the phone. You have to be present and in person to access that even with a FERPA waiver. So there's, like, there's little things um, to be considered even with the signing of FERPA, okay? So it's not as black and white or cut and dry as I can access the information now because my child signed a FERPA waiver. It doesn't obligate the school to share everything with you. Um, so I'm gonna start with this first question. Will higher education staff members or professor tell family members when their child is failing if they have a signed FERPA waiver? No. Yeah. <laughs> not only will they not tell you that your child is in danger of failing, they're not even required to tell you that your child actually has failed. So your student could get through the semester having failed every class and you wouldn't know because the grades don't go to you, they go to your student. Um, so you, the student actually takes over the, the rights to their educational information when they turn 18. So some of that transition may actually still happen in high school. Um, and then when they get to college, it's all their right. So. Um, and as Laura said, it's not an obligation for the university to share information if the student has signed the FERPA. It's, um, it gives permission. And so the university is not gonna take the initiative to communicate with families. Some of our support programs also have students sign a release so that we can communicate with parents. Um, and so we may be more likely to let you know, but I'll be honest, I don't tell parents when the student is failing if I know why the student is failing and we have a good plan to get it back on track, because why stress you out? Like if we know what we're doing, we know that a lot of students fail the first test in college and maybe I have had students who failed the first test in every single class they ever took. So I'm not gonna tell the parents every time because there's no reason to stress you out because I know it's not something to be anxious about. So we don't always, even with the support programs, when we have a release, we don't always initiate that contact either. I'm always happy to talk to parents if they communicate with me, if they ask for feedback, but we don't necessarily initiate. Yeah, and I see, I saw a lot of like horrified faces when we were talking about that. And usually what I hear is, but I'm, you know, I'm paying the bill, don't I get to know? Unfortunately, no. Um, that's, that's not, that's not our decision. <laughs> that's usually the policies and procedures. But I think like what it comes down to, at least from my perspective, is like think about why is it that you feel the need to know that information? And it's because as families, you've had that right. And for the most part, you've been in charge of your child's education. If they've been um, receiving special education services, you've had that right. It's literally written in IDEA as one of the tenets that it's parent, you know, parent information, parent communication. So as they're transitioning, the purpose of all of our programs is supporting the students' self-awareness, self-advocacy, their ability to be independent. And so what this means to me, and what my point is up here in talking about communication expectations, know before you go to college what you want your child to talk to you about in terms of grades, in terms of friends, in terms of missing class. How many people in here, I'm not, I'm not trying to call anyone out, but how many people in here skipped a class in high school or college? Okay, so somehow it becomes like this big deal, like I have to know if my child missed class. And the reality is that that's a typical college experience. Um, and so when you think about it in that frame of reference, like it, it changes your perspective a little bit 
have a conversation, and I would say I'll, I'll open the floor to all of you, like my recommendation is always for families to set communication expectations before orientation, before you're coming on campus. How often are you guys communicating? Is it every day? Is it every other day? Um, is it by text? Is it, you know, on Skype? Do people even use Skype anymore? I don't, I don't think so, right? I'm not that old. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> but like, you know, FaceTime, whatever. Um, like, how, how are you talking to people? Like, how are, you, how are you guys getting in touch? Do you need to know if they failed an exam? Do you need to know if they were late to class? Why? Why do you need to know that? What do each of you have as expectations for communication and what's important, all right? Like if their roommate is never going to class and like is not like cleaning up their room and stuff like that, like is that something you want them to communicate with you? Or is that something you're encouraging them to communicate with us? You know, it, it looks different. So that's like, that's where I stand on communication um, and trying to set ground rules so that it's not like, why didn't you tell me about this? Like talking to us or talking to the student, why didn't you tell me? You're, you're aligning those expectations before you ever come on campus. Yeah, I would agree about uh, who are you communicating it to because is it really helpful for the student to tell you if they're having roommate problems? Would it be make more sense for them to talk to their support program on campus where we have the connections and we can actually address it? Um, so I, you know, I think your, your goal hopefully is for your child to be independent and so this is part of that process. You're sort of passing the baton onto us and we're working with your student to get them ready for their next level of independence at each stage of the process. So I'm gonna move into our next topic and I'll give us about five minutes just so I can kind of keep on the timeline. Um, and the next topic is talking about college capable versus college ready. Um, so a little bit exploring that idea and then critical components for college readiness as well. Excellent. It was not lost at me right there. Look, I got it. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Let's talk about college capable. College capable is guess what? You graduated. You have all your high school requirements done. Congratulations. You are now eligible with your academic, your GPA, uh, behavior. You are now eligible to go to college. However, college able means what are the skills you're bringing with you to college? So you have heard everyone up here talk, uh, you've heard um, Laura talk about what is needed when you go to college. It's not, you no longer have that IEP team wrapped around you. It is now time to self-advocate. It is now time for you to go to your disability service office as a student and ask for those accommodations. It's now time for you to give your letter of accommodations to your faculty. When you need assistance on breaking down an assignment, it's up to you to be able to go and ask and be able to ask what you need clearly, right? It's being able to sit in that classroom, have accommodations. Maybe you want to pace it, find that area to pace in that classroom because you have an accommodation to do that where you're not disruptive to others, right? Because remember, you're going from that, um, what we talked about, that, el that entitlement of K through 12 to the eligibility of college, which means everybody in that room is paying to be there and to get that same type of educational experience. So in there, making sure that you also have that self-regulation. So how, what do I do when I fail that first test, right? I've never failed a test before. A 98 is failure to me, and I start to get upset. In a college classroom, that's not going to necessarily be the right environment to express those emotions. So in that, making sure that we have that self-regulation, making sure that we know how to self-advocate, recognizing when we're starting to get overstimulated and that self-awareness of coming out saying, nope, that light right back here is really, really bright, mm -hmm. right? It There's is. noises that are happening in this room right now that could start to overstimulate me. I need to know when it's time for me to stand up and walk out, right? That's that awareness piece in, that, in, in the rooms that you're in. It's not waiting, tolerating, boiling over until we eventually can't hold that in anymore because I've masked all 
of my autistic type behavior. So those are the components when we're talking about being college ready is that you're ready to transition into that young adulthood. You are now in charge of you advocating for what you need. You know what you need. You have had those open conversations about what autism is like for you. What accommodations you may need or ready to have that open conversation with people who support you. So that's what I look at from what's college, um, uh, college capable versus college ready. And when we're looking, I just mean the critical components, how to prepare. One, if you're still in high school, be active in those IEPs. Be active in listening to what those SDIs, that special delivery of instruction that comes at the end of your IEP, and you're saying extra time on a test, note taker, oh, you know what, I do really well with a word bank. I'm more of a text to speech person versus a speech to text person, right? All of those, be aware of that. Be aware of what you're sensitive to, smells, sounds, right? Tactile, like anything that you might have coming in. Be aware of that. Be aware of yourself when you start to feel overstimulated, overwhelmed. Are you ready to actually take that next step and walk out and realize you don't have to tell everybody in college. You just have to stand up and walk out. That's okay. So anyway, um, do you want to say something? Okay. Um, I did want to add to that, just the other things, you know, are you waking yourself up in the morning or is your mom still waking you up? Do you know that you have to shower or does someone have to tell you to shower? You know, things like that are also important. Do you know that you have to eat? Yeah. I've had students who've gone like all day without eating yeah. because no one was there to say, hey, it's time for dinner. So things like that are important too. No, that's perfect. Yeah, the eating one is always surprising to me. Like that's a consistent consideration because there's no lunch time in college. So there's always like people miss, you know, they're like, oh, wait, I had class. I didn't eat the entire day. And now I'm wondering why I can't focus on, any, on anything. Um, and I do that too. Actually, it's terrible. I haven't eaten yet today. Whoops. <laughs> um, so any um, specific skills that you would say, uh, how could you prepare to advocate as a student? So some of the things, you know, waking yourself up, any other things that you specifically want to highlight? to prepare to be a self-advocate. So coming back, I'm just gonna say, coming back to that, just being aware of what you need, because what you need is gonna be different than somebody else, what they need, right? So that's why I said being involved in those meetings, parents having open conversations with their student, with their, with their child, to make sure that they know, like, no, actually you don't know how to cook. <laughs> you don't know how to pack your lunch because I've been doing it for 12 years, right? Or 12 academic years. Making sure that they understand that piece. Do you know how to use public transportation? How you're going to get to class? Do you know how to navigate the class? Are you sure you know how to get across campus? What are you using? There is a great app for that, yeah. right? Um, because we have Google Maps. We have walking directions that way. So be, instead of doing for your student, teach them how to do it themselves. Don't pull up the app and say, here you go. No, from start to finish, this is how you would do it. Same thing happens in the workplace internship. Uh, earlier, we had talked about making sure um, that your student is prepared. They understand their accommodations. Do not go from place to place. Mom and dad are not going to call your employer and say, hey, how's Johnny doing? No, <laughs> you do not want mom and dad calling your employer, right? Laura mentioned making sure you establish communication. What's that communication look like? That also includes from employment, right? Making sure. I have students come through transition programs, and, and when they are there for the 12 days, there's a weekend in between if they stay on campus. Guess what? They have an entire script when they call home. Hey, Mom, Dad, how you doing? How was your week? Mine was good. I liked this, right? This is what I didn't like, because let's be honest, there's going to be something they haven't liked about uh, the week. And then it's, I'm looking forward to doing this. What do you have planned? Right? All right, I'll see you on Friday. Bye. The reason why is we want them to be able to give information. <laughs> it's okay to say something that you didn't like the food, whatever it may be on campus. What you're looking forward to the next week. 
but don't forget to ask mom and dad how they're doing because students, they're probably not doing so well. They miss you and they're worried about you. So asking them how, how they're doing. Thank you. Um, any final pieces of advice for students or parents in the room? Oh boy, <laughs> so this is mine. <laughs> so first of all, you know, when I was 17, 18, 19, any advice that was given to me just went right out the back door. So <laughs> not offended if anybody in this room is wondering why is this random man giving me advice. Um, and, uh, you know, I get it. Um, you know, you're at a transition point. You're moving from one area of life into another. And that's awesome, first of all. Um, you've made it this far. You're going to continue, whether it's in employment or in college. So there's a lot to look forward to. And I think you should be excited about that, right? You should be um, hopeful, I hope. Um, at the same time, I think know your why, right? Yes. What What is your why for going to college? What is your why for getting a job? Um, to be clear, there's not a right or wrong answer. You know, my why might be, you know, I want to make a lot of money. Great. So how are you going to get there? Um, maybe your why right now is mom and dad say so. Um, that wouldn't be uncommon at all. Um, but start thinking of reasons because when you show up to Chestnut Hill, Drexel, you know, St. Joe's, University of Delaware, um, the first day is going to be easy, right? That's going to be the easiest part. You're just going to be there and you're going to wave goodbye to mom and dad and your brother and sister and you're going to be like, yes, I'm finally free. Uh, but what are you, what's, you know, what's going to motivate you halfway through the semester? Um, no one's going to come knock on the door. You need to be, you need to be willing and ready to do that, um, to get up each morning, to go to class, or maybe skip a few classes, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, why are you here? What do you want out of it? And how can the people who are in programs like ours, but all the university staff, be supporting, supportive of you in that quest and use it. Use the support. Um, I know it's very, very easy for me up here to say to you all, just use support, it's not a big deal. I recognize that's not exactly how all people might feel um, and want to avoid asking for help. I get that. Um, and if you decide to do that, great, that's your choice. Um, but my experience has taught me that Asking for help is not a sign of weakness whatsoever. It's in fact probably the students that thrive the most are the ones asking for help. So again, that's one of those little nuggets. You can take that, you can throw that out the door, whatever. But you know, that's why programs like ours exist, right? We're here for you. We want to make sure that the experience you're having is meaningful, it's rich, it's deep, but the scary part is you are an adult now, right? And the single, the one word that probably comes with adulthood that you didn't have up to this point is the R word, responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and sooner or later you learn this, we all do. Um, and it's not gonna be perfect, right? You're gonna have tough times, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna go home on weekends, um, but you're gonna have great times too. And so embrace all of that um, it's part of what makes, I think, college an amazing experience. You know, you get four years, five years, six years of, you know, really getting to be who you want to be. You know, all that stuff that happened in high school, middle school, that's in the past. Um, now you're the one making the shots. You're really exploring, doing things to the extent you want. You know, I always tell students, hey, this thing is happening. If you're interested in it, go for it. But I'm not going to make you. You know, no one's going to make you. Um, and I think sometimes students are actually a little surprised by that. Sometimes they actually think in the back of their head, someone's going to come and like make it happen for them. They're not. They just aren't. You have to make it happen. Uh, you have to study. You have to get you know, get C's, get B's, whatever. Just get a degree. But um, you are the one who's going to make it happen or not. So maybe that's not entirely helpful advice, but it is the truth. Um, for parents, I think, 
you know, <laughs> you either already are or will be having existential crises, <laughs> you know, for the next four or five years. Um, similarly, I would, you know, first of all, just acknowledge that, embrace that. <laughs> you know, your um, son, daughter, whatever is is leaving. Or maybe they're not, maybe they're commuting, that's okay. But I find parents are, is there like a funny transcription on the screen or something? Yeah. They're bleeding? Oh geez, yeah. I hope not. Uh, hopefully there's not like, you know. Anyway, um, how are we on time by the way? Um, you know, your, your child is growing up, and again, easy for me to say, but you know, you have an opportunity, I think, to redefine your role, too. Um, my personal opinion is that treat your child like an adult, like you would your colleagues at work, like you would um, people in life that you respect, that you take seriously, that you listen to, that you learn from, um, and coach them, help them explore this experience without just saying, just do it, or just, because that's not motivating, right? Like I said, students, you need to know your why. You have to be motivated to do it. Parents, you have to learn to give them the space to do that. And many of you are probably already doing this, by the way. But I think that um, that's my biggest piece of advice. Thank you. All right, guys, we are going to, oh, yes. Just really quick, um, as a parent of an autistic college student who's getting ready to graduate, and um, 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 thank you. Very exciting. Um, my youngest just started college in the fall with different disabilities. I just wanted to affirm for the parents, it's not your imagination. It is harder to coach your student through doing the things they need to do for their independence than it is to do it for them, but it doesn't last forever, and you can do it. Thank you. So thank you all of our panelists for this discussion. Um, really appreciate it. And I think we got a lot of really positive information about the, the transition from our perspective um, and moving into being college and career ready. So thank you.